that instead of having you know a mutated protein that's made, we switch it and it uses the one that doesn't have a mutation and therefore it corrects it. Now we hear a lot about cancer research, but did you know that there have been distinct similarities found between cancer cells and neuronal cells involved in the epilepsies? Today, Madeleine Aldin, a PI of the Aldin Lab, tells us about her extraordinary research into this, inspired by her daughter, Margot. I'm Madeleine Odin. I'm an assistant professor at Tufts University in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. And I'm a researcher. My lab works on cancer, but also on epilepsy, uh, which I started after my daughter, Margot, who's two years old, was diagnosed with a mutation in the SCN8A gene that causes epilepsy. So I've been mostly in cancer, but now in the epilepsy space for a couple of years. Um, was there going over to the epilepsy side um, to do with Margot as well? Was that the motivation? Yes, that definitely was uh, the motivation. Mm. Yeah. And so everyone knows she is ultra cute as well. We met in Denmark a couple of weeks ago. Ultra cute. So um, tell us about your work. And well, you've got um, your own lab, obviously. I've checked out the website. It's really cool. Could you give us all a bit of an overview and... And tell us a bit about the connection between the cancers and epilepsies. I actually started my research career in neuroscience. So I did my PhD in neuroscience at King's College London. And I was studying how newly generated cells in the brain move around to go to the right place. And I thought that was really cool. But I uh, realized that cancer cells also move around in the body. And that's the process called metastasis when tumors spread throughout the body. And so I decided that I kind of wanted to switch. Also, because when I was looking at how these newly generated cells move in the brain, I took movies of the cells. They looked a lot like cancer cells. And um, a lot of the molecules that are known to uh, drive uh, the movement of cells in the developing brain or in the adult brain also regulate uh, the movement of cancer cells throughout the body. So actually, in my postdoc, when I, I moved to MIT to work on uh, cancer metastasis, but the molecule I was working on, MENA, is known to uh, regulate the developing brain and the movement of newly generated cells in the brain as it's forming. And this process of movement is critical. And if the cells don't move to the right place, then you can get you know, um, things like focal cortical dysplasia, uh, where, you know, the brain pattern doesn't form and that leads to epilepsy and that, can, you know, cause various uh, issues with regards to causing seizures. So this movement of the cells in the developing brain is really important. So, so I was studying this molecule, Nina, that, you know, we knew was really important in the brain, but then we had recently found that it was really high in breast tumors as well. And so the lab I was in was, you know, really curious as to like why, do these tumors, you know, have this really high level of uh, this uh, protein that, you know, we thought was mainly important in the brain. And so we found that, you know, this uh, protein regulates the metastasis of breast cells to other sites in the body. And so if the tumors have a lot of this, then they tend to be more metastatic, more aggressive, leading to patients dying. And so I did a lot of research trying to, to understand this. And so, you know, as I was, you know, studying this, you know, it was like, this molecules in cancer in the brain. And, and there were a few other studies coming out suggesting that other molecules that can help neurons, you know, guide in the brain can also drive metastasis. So the similarity between, you know, cancer cells and neurons and the developing brain, because cancers, you know, are, are tissues that uh, are cells that kind of uh, de-differentiate, they kind of go back to like an earlier stage in development. And so we think that maybe that um, has to do with it. And so but this kind of neuronal link was really fascinating to me. And so um, when I started my own uh, independent lab at Tufts University about five and a half years ago, I was continuing to you know, study breast cancer, but really curious about these neuronal properties of, of tumor cells. And so um, the other thing that we started uh, looking at was ion channels that are present in tumors. And so we know ion channels regulate the activity of neurons. And, you know, many of those are mutated and cause uh, epilepsies, um, lots of, you know, um, DEs, developmental uh, epilepsies. And that's one, you know, my daughter has a mutation in a sodium channel. And so we started studying uh, these ion channels in breast cancer and found that specifically potassium channels were really um, high and at the protein level in a particular subtype of breast cancer. So we found that these potassium channels can regulate the electrical properties of tumor cells and regulate their metastasis. And so then we were able to take a potassium channel blocker, 
a drug, you know, that is FDA approved. This is one that's approved for arrhythmias, but use it for, um, uh, to uh, inhibit metastasis in breast cancer. So we're taking drugs that are approved, you know, for other disorders for cancer. And there's other work in the UK going on by the Brackenberry lab where they've looked at sodium channels. And so they, for example, have repurposed phenytoin or dilantin that we know, you know, is commonly used to treat epilepsies. Um, and that they also found could inhibit metastasis in a mouse model of breast cancer. So, you know, this idea that we could, you know, uh, what we, the drugs that we have for epilepsy could be used to treat cancer, you know, is suddenly, you know, maybe this is something that, that could be done for patients. And in the other direction, you know, um, we've been learning a lot in the epilepsy field, or I mean, you know, researchers who are working on this about mutations in the brain that drive, that are associated with, um, you know, temporal lobe epilepsy, right? So lots of patients are getting surgical resections now that they're sending for sequencing to see that what mutations are present. And um, I was struck by a lot of the literature showing that, you know, a lot of the mutations coming up in these uh, epileptic, you know, tissues are mutations in pathways like MAP kinase or mTOR. These are pathways that are known in cancer to drive tumors. You know, these are really, that can be mutated in, in many, uh, many tumor types. And so, um, you know, seeing the, these data, you know, obviously the next step would be, well, could we then use maybe some of the cancer drugs, you know, to perhaps also help with certain seizures if they have these mutations that activate these pathways. So I've been really struck uh, you know, as I've gotten in to get to know epilepsy um, in the last few years, to see the similarities, you know, between uh, tumor cells and neuronal cells, and you know what we learn in cancer could be helpful in epilepsy and vice versa, and that this could, you know, really open up a lot of new new treatments. Um, the other thing with a lot of these, you know, drug repurposing or using drugs that are approved for other disorders is that they're much quicker to get to patients, right? Because they've already been through. A lot of the toxicology studies, um, and so repurposing a drug, um, you know, is could reduce or is known to reduce, you know, the time to approval and being used um, by a lot and a lot cheaper too. So this could really open up, you know, lots of new avenues for drugs for for patients in in both directions. This is just wild. I'm just like, I'd never thought of. Uh, the link between cancer cells and <laughs> and the epilepsies. Um, so, what, what are you actually doing in your lab, like right now? How are things laid out? What, in, like, how many projects are going at the same time? What's the time scale? I, I actually recently received um, a grant from the NCI, the National Cancer Institute in the U.S., to study the neuronal identity of tumors. So, I'm studying, you know, uh, the ion channels in tumor cells. Um, we've also found that tumor cells express other neuronal genes that are important for neuronal function. Um, and so we're studying, you know, why do these tumors have these? Do they take advantage of this to like, you know, grow? Um, so, so we're studying that. We're also studying, because um, now we know that there are also nerves within tumor tissues. So breast tissue does not have much, uh, many nerves uh, when it's healthy, but when there's a tumor, all these nerves come in and they can, uh, are associated with worse outcomes. And so we're trying to understand, you know, how do these nerves come in? What are they doing to the tumors? And again, potentially if we could, you know, borrow drugs from the epilepsy space to, you know, hone down these nerves that are there and shut them off and have them die. Uh, and then that could be one other way to kind of hit at a tumor. So that's a big part of my lab where we're trying to understand, um, like I said, the neuronal properties of the tumor cells, but also how nerves and tumors in, in the periphery, so in the breast tissue, interact to cause cancer. And so there we're actually using a lot of like tools from the epilepsy space to measure, you know, activity of neurons, drugs, things like that. So we're also taking advantage of that. That's so cool. Give us a sample. What sort of tools are you using that, you know, you're researching breast cancer, but you... Yeah. So, you know, we're taking their, you know, all the tools like electrophysiology, right? To be able to measure the activity of neurons, which is commonly used, um, you know, to study how different mutations might affect um, you know, neuronal activity and, and seizure formation. So we're doing electrophysiology on tumor cells. We're also using uh, these engineering tools called microelectrode arrays, which are chips to be able to measure um, the uh, activity of, of lots of cells at the same time at, at a more circuit level. And so um, we're also using that um, on our tumor cells to be able to measure their electrical properties. 
Uh, so those are some ways that we're uh, we're also using yeah, these reporters to measure the activity of neurons uh, to, to do that as well. So so yeah, so that's been cool. Reusing stuff again. Exactly. So we're also starting epilepsy research as well in my lab. We've started a couple of years ago. And so we're starting now working on the stn 8 ion channel, which is the one that my daughter has the mutation. Um, there's about um, 700 patients in the world that have mutations in this gene, although we expect that to increase a lot um, with the advent of genetic sequencing for patients. And this gene is really important. Um, it's a key regulator of neuronal activity in the brain. And we think that, you know, even targeting this could be helpful for other epilepsies caused by other genes, um, even in the context of, you know, a traumatic brain injury or something like that, because tuning the activity of SDNA or the protein NAV1.6, you know, is really, could it really help, you know, tuning down the activity of neurons in lots of contexts because it's so important. So we think it's a really key regulatory knob that we could turn um, in the brain. So, um, so we're focusing on that, um, and um, specifically, we're 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 focusing on using ASOs or antisense oligonucleotides to be able um, to manipulate the um, the identity of the of the protein. So this this gene actually has two different versions that become proteins. There's a neonatal version and an adult version, and so. Um, there's a little part of the gene where there's two versions and you, the cell kind of picks one or the other. And so you have a balance. There are many patients, including my daughter, that have a mutation in this region. And so what we're trying to do is switch it so that the cell doesn't use the one that's mutated, but instead uses the other one that is correct. So that instead of having you know, a mutated protein that's made, we switch it and it uses the one that doesn't have a mutation, and therefore it corrects it. So we're trying to see you know, if we can correct this mutation in this channel and, and normalize it, you know, what effect does that have on seizures? What effect does that have um, on development? And, you know, how does that tune the activity of, of the protein? So we're developing those um, in my lab. And I'll bring it back to cancer because uh, this um, there's these two versions I, I mentioned. And um, one of the versions is also really abundant in breast cancer. And so now we're thinking maybe this tool that we're developing could be used for patients with epilepsy, but maybe we could also use it in cancer to actually, you know, reduce metastasis um, by uh, targeting uh, this this version of the of the gene that's been shown to be involved in cancer. That's so exciting! So, gosh, bringing two groups of pretty awful diseases together, but in a positive way. So, I mean, at what stage are you? Uh, on what are you uh, testing, doing the tests? Are we talking about rodents? Are we talking about potentially humans soon? Or Currently, yeah, we started this work about a year ago, but we are working currently um, in cells, so in, in cancer cells and then in, in um, cultured neuronal cells and primary cells from mouse models. Um, but we're getting ready to move into mouse models. So we're starting those um, that work uh, this summer. Uh, so we're working on that. Um, and then um, my uh, daughter, Margo, is actually also uh, uh, accepted in this Enlorem Foundation, which is developing ASOs, um, you know, N of one ASOs for, for patients. And so they're also working to develop a human form to be able to um, have her, you know, be injected with those, you know, first to see um, if that can help her. So um, so we're working with them to be able to, you know, they're the experts on, on the human part. We are only working in the in vitro and in vivo. Um, so so that'll be great to at least, you know, see if this can work. Uh, and then whether we can expand this then to, to more patients and uh, more models. So so that's where things are at right now. Amazing. So for people who are listening who aren't, you know, overly clued up on on neuroscience and research and genetics, we have here uh, an incredible neuroscientist who is using potentially this product service on their own child, Margot. And so things are, are to be trusted. They needn't be as scary. And we have wonderful people like you, Madeline, you know, speaking in layman terms, which is fantastic. If anyone wants to learn more about what you do, your work, I'm going to put links into onto the website, to your fab website, um, and obviously links on social media. Um, if anybody, would, is there any other way that people can get in touch, whether they be clinician scientists or, or patients? Please send us an email. Uh, uh, you can find it on my website, madelineodenlab.com. I'm on Twitter. 
And I also have an Instagram account for my daughter, Margot, called Margot underscore the brave, where we share her story and try to raise awareness and raise funds for research. So you can also learn about life with SDNA epilepsy through that. Thank you so much to Madeline, who is working on such an exciting area linking cancers and the epilepsies. And thank you also to Margot for being the inspiration. Stay tuned to Madeline's work and check out the rare genetic epilepsy SCN8A as well. Links will be on the website.